And now, it's time for another edition of the 12th Man Fan Jam. With your host, the Reverend Moses of the St. Paul Island Church of Seahawk Positivity. Yes, thank you, Magic Voice. This is the self-appointed Reverend Moses of the St. Paul Island Church of Seahawk Positivity. And welcome, one and all, to a very special Cardinal Part 2 edition of the 12th Man Fan Jam. The show made up of Seahawk fans from around the world talking about your Super Bowl champion, Seattle Seahawks. Over the next few moments we share together, we hope that you are entertained and enlightened as we discuss the upcoming game for your defending Super Bowl champion, Seattle Seahawks, against the Arizona Cardinals. So sit back, relax, grab a Cardinal beverage of sin or choice, and remember, North Korea ain't stopping this show, baby. As is the usual with every show, we are not alone. No, I am joined like I am every episode by the 12th Man Fan Jam Posse, a ragtag group of diehard Seahawk fans from around the world. First, the Ying to my Yang. You can find his videos on the Suffolk Blue YouTube channel. He is a regular card among American football fans in England. For merry old England, it is Matt. Hi, Matt. Hello, Mezzles. Good morning. How are you? I'm wonderful, Matt. How are you today? Well, I bring good news and bad. No. What's the good news? Well, the good news is, is contrary to Fox News, the Super Bowl is not cancelled. Yay! What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is some dude from Korea has apparently bought the television rights and you're all not allowed to see it. Excellent! Damn, that Tim jong Il he runs everything. Too soon? <laughs> but, no, not too soon at all. And bring it, buddy! Bring it, North Korea! That's all I'm saying. All right. Next is our news hound. You can find his 12th man editorials on SeahawksOut.com. His news is an oasis of knowledge in a desert of non-knowledge. <laughs> He's Shadowhawk <laughs> Will. Hi, Will. Hey, Moses. Uh, good to see you guys, but, you know, it's kind of kind of been a rough evening for me. Oh, what happened? Well, you know, I'm just sitting here by myself, and like Kim Jong-il, I'm just, I'm so lonely, so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Just get nice. a piano roll. <laughs> if only. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I could see that making an appearance tonight. Uh, speaking of someone who's not ever Ronry, from the state of Washington, he always is in a zona at tailgating. In a zona tailgating. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's Dustin. Hi, Dustin. <laughs> hey, guys. What's going on? I'm glad I could make it. I'm a, I'm a late game ad. I was actually at the in laws of Wenatchee. Decided to come back this morning specifically, so I didn't miss this show two weeks in a row. Oh, so, that's Aww. nice. Aww. You know, and I, you know what the kids love that. Kids, did you hear that? That's that. Yay! Thank you, Dustin. That is dedication right there. The kids love that, and uh, also, and it got me out of the in-laws house. So I was going to say, I think that was uh, Dustin's true motivation, right? Oh there. yes, even bigger motivation. <laughs> Uh, also motivated from the state of California and just up the road for 49er headquarters where they are mourning the end of their playoff st- season. Our own man behind enemy lines. He dines on the tears of the 49er nation. You know him as Zorn76. We know him as Statsman Mark. Hi, Mark. Hey, everybody. I'm in the land where 49er tickets are, are selling like hotcakes very cheap on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> And we love that. The kids love that. Hey, kids, the 49ers tickets are... Yay! Hey, all right. We're gonna hashtag, hashtag bandwagoners. Yes. <laughs> hashtag what else is there to do in California in the winter? Okay. Well, the interest have been made. So let's get to this show. For those of you who listened before, thank you for joining us. Once again, for those who are listening for the very first time, don't worry. We promise we will be gentle, but be careful. We might inadvertently cause an act of war during this evening. So, the first quarter, the the game, the show is run. The game, the show is run with four quarters, just like a real NFL game. In our first quarter of the show, we will have news from Shadow Hawk Will. In quarter two, we will talk about last week's victory against the San Francisco 49ers. At halftime this week, we're doing something a little special. We are paying—I don't want to say paying respects. We're reveling in the fact that the 49ers' playoff hopes have. Uh, have disappeared for the 2014 season. So we're going to have a little eulogy for them and their playoff hopes that they had for the 2014 season. So you want to tune in for that for sure. Quarter three, we're going to talk about this week's game against the Arizona Cardinals in Arizona for the division in all likelihood. And we're going to finish up the fourth quarter with our keys to the game, our predictions, our prognostications, and our game balls. We'd like to remind you, 
We want you to like, share, subscribe to this video, subscribe to the Seahawk Positivity YouTube channel, or on the thread in which you find this video. We'd love to know what you think of this silly little show, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. Also, email us, 12thmanfanjam at gmail.com. Before you do all that, you probably want to hear the show to comment about it. So let's get the show started with news. Yes, news, because you were too busy holiday shopping for just that perfect gift for me. It is our own Shadow Hog, Will. Will, what do you have for us this evening? So Moses, I can't help but notice that some of my best news items involve Twitter in some fashion. And well, tonight's tonight's not going to be much different. <clears throat> um, my first uh, news item involves uh, Jets owner Woody Johnson, who may have in- inadvertently let slip uh, what he thinks of some of his, the members of his own team. Are you um, saying? Are you saying? Are you saying the Jets let Woody slip? <laughs> it's, it's quite possible. Yes. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Close. <laughs> no, it's no problem. Um, a fan on Twitter uh, sent Woody a message saying, "Quote." You really need to hashtag fire Idzik, referring to general manager John Idzik, at this point. This roster is garbaggio. Well, Woody Johnson <laughs> actually favorited that tweet. Mm. Before very quickly unfavoring it and then putting up a tweet of his own. Quote, have to be more careful when scrolling through my Twitter feed. The tweet I most recently favored favorited was inadvertent. Uh, right, yeah. right, right, right. What the hell's Garbaggio? Garbaggio. I've got garbage. I've got Garbaggio. <laughs> that soup. It, I, well, you know, it's either soup. It sounds like it sounds like a musician or a magician, ladies and gentlemen. The great Garbaggio will now make you disappear. <laughs> it could be. Well, they've they've made the Jets' playoff hopes disappear. <laughs> Well said. Uh, yeah, this, uh, I, the old man, I guess. Old Woody let it slip. He hit the wrong button. and oh, Easily oops. done. Yeah. Easily yeah. done. Did you ever see the one, the lady uh, on Facebook, when she <laughs> she thought she was on the search, and she wasn't? <laughs> and she put up oh, like, yes. something really obscene. And then it like it was like her status for like an hour, and she didn't uh, realize she it. Yeah, it. and then she's Get like... Oh my God! I can't believe that was my status. Maybe this will wise me up. I'm such a terrible person, but uh, yeah. Or or someone puts their like ex boyfriend or girlfriend and what they think is the search engine, and yeah. it winds up being their status. That's kind of like what sounds like something Woody would do, doesn't it? Even over here in the UK, we've got the, uh, one of our politicians who was actually awarded and named the most boring politician in Britain. Accidentally managed to put up a pair of boobs <laughs> as a favourite on his Twitter account, <laughs> and he was still voted. The most boring politician in Britain. Wow! Seriously? <laughs> Damn. How boring is this guy? That's oh, a rough, that's oh, a rough crowd. Dull. I can't even remember his name. Is that dull? How bad were the boobs? Oh, I didn't well, check. Some said maybe it was boring because they were everybody's favorite. So it was just... Everybody's uh, favorite <laughs> boobs. Well, okay, yeah. But well, still. everybody puts up boobs, I mean, you know. <laughs> Not enough people, sadly. And that's very true. That's just very sad. Well, t- too bad Woody let it slip. Let it slip out. I guess they just let Woody slip out. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Just keep saying it. <laughs> I'm trying to put a connection there. I'm going to have King Joe Una cancel the show or whatever the hell his name is. That in French will be easier. <laughs> it's a bunch of garbage so far. All right. Well, what do you got? What do you got? Another story. Get me out of this, this hole, please. Well, Moses, this one also involves Twitter, but it actually involves some uh, intentional posts on Twitter, which probably shouldn't have been. (laughs) Um, Falcons linebacker Sean Witherspoon has been laid up pretty much all season with a torn Achilles tendon, but decided to take to Twitter in an uh, uh, advance of Sunday's showdown with the uh, division-leading New Orleans Saints. Uh, Witherspoon sent several messages. The first one, quote, The Aints are way too sorry to have our names in their mouth. Our team will be bringing a broom to the bayou. Okay, <laughs> obnoxious, but not too bad. But it gets better. Next you should tweet. probably bring sandbags to the bayou because sometimes uh, the levees get overran by water. That's what I think. It's, it's possible. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, Witherspoon's next tweet, quote, They won't let me talk to the media, referring to his own team, but they don't know my Twitter password. <laughs> Been a part of this division for five years, won the division twice. Oh, no. <laughs> and then finally, his last tweet, 
quote, that last tweet was for you Aints fans that act like they have just kicked our ass since 2010. (laughs) G-O-M-D. And if you're wondering what G-O-M-D stands for, uh, go to UrbanDictionary.com, and oh, it's fairly obvious at that That's point. our favorite site, G-O-M-D. Uh, UrbanDictionary.com should be a sponsor of the show. Yeah, it really it should. definitely should be. It really should be. I think so. It's, some of these people, you know, when people have Twitter, this is what you get, pretty much. Pretty much. This is the warning that the NFL has, but it has a contract that says you must talk to the media, otherwise you'll be fined. They didn't have Twitter in mind when they did, when they put that clause in. Um, well, I think so, all you have to do at that point is, like, at Ian Rappaport, when you say that, and that's talking to the media, right? That's <laughs> all you have to do. Marshawn Lynch should try that. You wouldn't need yeah. to do that, because an anonymous source would talk for you, so it wouldn't be a problem. Is it- True. Is it me, or, or does the Saints Falcons matchup feel like two homeless people fighting in the alley over a bottle instead of like a pay per view? <laughs> <Bum fight! laughs> wow. Get Kimbo Slice over here, quick. <laughs> hey, what was that first quote again? Something about putting something in their mouths? I, I, that just really sounded weird. The Aints are way too sorry to have our names in their mouths. I just that just doesn't sound right. I don't think that sounds as cool as he thought it did before he put it down. I'm uh, Woody didn't tweet that. Yeah, really. <laughs> Jerry Jerry Jones was all over that tweet. I tell you, he was all over it. <laughs> that is glory hole. I, I when I worked I worked here over in India, and I got a friend. Of course, one of the, the guys that worked with me is a it was a diehard Colts fan, obviously. And he said, "I swear, somebody should go get our owners uh, Ursay's Twitter." And just say, I'm going to run your Twitter for you. And just say, when he said, put this down. Okay, I'll put it down. I put nothing down. And he said, hey, someone should like take over the owner's Twitter. And I think some of these players, somebody should come in and say, we'll take your Twitter over for you. You go play football. We'll tell them I said this. Okay, we'll tell them. And then don't do it. You know? Because <laughs> some of these guys are such morons. Honestly, if I was a general manager, if I signed somebody, I would throw in an extra million into their contract for a promise not to go on Twitter. Yeah. I think that's a wise choice. Which is too bad because it's not all bad. I mean, you get that mm-hmm. little rare chance where you get some feedback from a player, which is really cool. But then, you know, unfortunately, some people are always, I don't know. Then you see how stupid some players are. All right. Uh, is your last story a Twitter story, too? No, it's not. But uh, it does involve player feedback. All right. Specifically, uh, feedback from former Seahawks wide receiver Golden Tate. Uh, Tate was interviewed for um, a radio show on 710 ESPN Seattle, uh, The Barber Shop, which aired uh, Friday night at 9. At the time of this recording, uh, we have not heard the entire interview, but two quotes were aired on 710 ESPN's afternoon show, Danny, Dave, and more. And they are fairly, uh, they're destined to stir up a fair amount of controversy surrounding Uh, young Mr. Tate. So anyway, I've transcribed those and I'm going to run through the quotes really quick. First quote, there's a lot of speculation on why I left Seattle with the whole Percy Harvin situation going down with him having high expectations and then him leaving his second year. I felt like I wasn't appreciated until all that went down and I'm happy in Detroit because I've been appreciated from day one. Oh, well, the second quote's going to be even more entertaining uh, in a annoying kind of way. Quote, when talking about the Seahawks, and I actually uh, edited out a bit of crosstalk with the host here. Obviously, the defense is spectacular. They're playing lights out, and they're getting hot at the right moment, I mean. And the offense, they have some really good players on offense. I got to give a shout out to my boys, Jay Curse and Doug Baldwin. Doing the best with the situation they're in, a run-heavy offense with a a pretty good quarterback, I guess. <laughs> so you heard it here. Golden Tate thinks Russell Wilson is a, pretty, a good. pretty good quarterback, I guess. Okay, before we start, I'm just going to say this, and then I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to let you guys talk. But my reaction... Oh, my God. Who the hell cares? Okay, you guys can go. I'm done. <laughs> um, Nice. Yeah, that's, that says it, doesn't it? I mean, I think all I would want to say is, is first and foremost, to say a big thank you to Golden Tate for the 2013 season, for being a big part of my Super Bowl dream, because he was. 
Um, you know, five touchdowns, 898 yards. Thanks for that. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, those five touchdowns delivered from a pretty okay quarterback. Um, but I understand why he's. I understand why Golden gets annoyed. I suppose because if you are a receiver and you're part of a run-heavy um, offense, which means you're not going to get as much, you know, stats and as much recognition <laughs> as a running back, for example. I sort of get that you're going to be a little bit annoyed uh, about that. I suppose. But that, what that doesn't really sort of understand me is why, um, you know, when he when he uh, was about to leave, that he offered a hometown discount to stay. Um, I don't understand how this 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 offense, which hasn't really changed a great deal since he's left, to be honest, apart from the fact that Percy Harvin that would be the boogeyman and got shoved off to the Jets. But why would you say I want to? I'm going to give you a hometown discount to stay somewhere where I feel like I want to stay, where you know, where I get wins and where we have a good, great team and a great you know feeling. But all of a sudden now. You know, he wasn't appreciated. Then why did you want to take less money to stay? Hmm. Well said. Um, did you – I want to recap real quick before I send this to Dustin. Did you Did you say that Golden Tate is a part of your dreams? Is that big part, little part? No, no. He, he, was, a, he was a part. <laughs> don't mix that. Don't, you've been in – we've got one of the moods on tonight, man. So you'll be slapped slap legs when I get over there. Um, no, he, he, he was a part of my Super Bowl dream. Oh, okay. And I thank him for that because I think we should. I, before we yeah. everyone has a go at sure. Golden Tate, Golden Tate was the number one receiver for us. Agreed. Whilst Percy Harvin was having his 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 ego massaged <clears throat> in the injury room. Agreed. Agreed. Dustin, your thoughts? Well, first of all, I want to add some context to the uh, his appreciation, how he felt appreciated thing. I, I had the chance to listen to the full interview um, before we got on a- on air here, and uh, it's a show hosted apparently by. Marcus Trufant, and I think Sir Mixalot was the other guy on there, which was kind of a surprise. Sweet. But um, Golden, they asked him about the fans in particular, and he said there's he, there's nobody better. The fans are ridiculous here, and he loves them. He said they were really, really great fans. So I was playing in front of them. But the I think where he felt like he wasn't appreciated was from the front office, and I'm sure it has everything to do with his contract offer. And um, they were paying so much to Percy Harvin and having to save so much money for other players that I, I feel like that's why he felt disrespected or unappreciated was from the front office and the money they were trying to give him. So on that point, I don't have much to say because I, I get where he's coming from in that respect. But the whole thing about Russell Wilson, if you heard it and heard how he said it and like the inflection in his voice, uh, the, the, you can tell there's some animosity there. He doesn't like Russell Wilson. <laughs> and that was not like how it's how it's quoted is direct context to how he felt. And uh, I just want to say, if he wants to go over to a, a place with a quote real quarterback and have you know a thousand yard seasons with eighty something catches, good for you, dude. Um, you'd have been better off staying at a team that's going to play in a system and win Super Bowls. So you. you have fun in in Detroit, a real I- football town. How how much of how much of this animosity towards Wilson Wilson really comes from a blog post that was posted in April about Wilson and his wife and the divorce and and alleged things and all this nonsense? Because looking at his Twitter feed, which I did tonight actually, I went through it for forty five minutes to have a look at it. There are so many posts about him defending the fact that he never actually slept with Russell Wilson's wife. So you know, I wonder whether how much of that has got to do with with some of this sort of underlying animosity from. Well, maybe well, I'm it's sure, a Shawn I'm Michaels sure that's quote. That's part of it. Good. I'm gonna say maybe it's a Shawn Michaels quote where he talks about we didn't sleep, we were up all night, that type of thing. That's probably uh, why he can deny sleeping with her, huh? Well, there was also um, on the afternoon show they also played a quote from Russell Wilson, where basically they asked him in training camp where uh, how they would how much they would miss Golden Tate, and he basically said, "I think we'll be just fine. I believe the guys we have." We have more speed and can make more plays, I think, down the field and do some very, very special things. So that that could play into it, too. But um, Danny O'Neill also made the great point of, you know, people are wishing, oh, I wish we'd kept Golden Tate. But Tate clearly, um, and you can fault him for this or understand this, Tate clearly wants to be a big player in this league. He wants to get mm-hmm. the stats. He wants to get the recognition and the Pro Bowls. And going back, Matt, to what you said, you know, why he would take a hometown discount to stay here. How much, how long would it have worked if he had stayed here? 
I mean, he's not going to get the stats and the Pro Bowls and the recognition playing well, this, a receiver in this offense. No, he's not. No, he's not. But, we, but we, with with Percy Harvin, who, if Percy Harvin had stayed as well, then you know how long would it have lasted? Probably until Golden Tate got smacked in the face again. That's probably how long it would have lasted. So his his attitude, I don't know. There's something something doesn't gel here. He's got his he's obviously got his little click. He's got his um, uh, curse, and he's got his uh, Baldwin. Those are his you know his dudes, his his friends. He says openly on Twitter, "I miss them, I miss them." Um, but he doesn't miss anyone else. <laughs> <Just me. laughs> yeah, Mark. Mark, what's your thoughts on all this? Well, I was just gonna say, um, and, and and Matt uh, mentioned it. Uh, just a moment ago that had he stayed with with harvin i mean he would have been how many times would he have been knocked out it would have been like do you like one lumps or two like a cartoon you know <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> um but it, you know what i mean of course anyone that goes to detroit um and you're playing opposite uh calvin johnson you're you're gonna get plenty of targets and plenty of receptions and and i just always look at our offense and if russell wilson were asked to be a, you know more of a passer he could do it you know provided we could right you know right. protect him longer than 1.8 seconds but you know right, right. He, he you know russell wilson is more than capable of being as good a prolific passer as anybody if he had all those attempts and all those chances but golden tate i appreciated him he finally became a good player i'm glad he was around to help us with the super bowl and i wish him well um but you know it's uh, yes once harvin was gone we missed him but you know this team is is, is so scrappy and 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 curse and and baldwin and uh, i don't know is norwood out for this game i thought it, i don't know if he's hurt or um no he's he's not no, he's hurt fine. he's not he'll be, he'll be here okay it just um, depends on if he's inactive or not you never know it just depends on who they activate right i mean it's just you know we miss him but you know i don't i don't think you know obviously it hasn't affected us uh, record wise this year so you know we're going to be good and and you know we have we have a good shot at another ring and you know he's he's in the a or nfc north and he's in you know, he's in detroit i mean that's just right, that's, right. you know that's just tough <laughs> well and that's where i'd like to kind of end the conversation he is he is his quarterback throws 350 yards a game he has megatron on the other side of the field He's going to get the big stats. He's going to get the big numbers. But to me, and, I, and what bothered me when I saw him tweet tonight was, hey, you know, God, those, you know, Curson, Curson and Baldwin could get a thousand yards in a different offense. What well, you know what? We don't care about that. We'd rather have another ring. And I think that's kind of the point that bothered me. His first thought is, look at all the stats you could get, dude. This team isn't about stats. This team is about wins, but and they don't the care who gets it. Moses, yeah. he he he's equating stats with money. It's exactly right. what he did right. when he when he got sure. his best season here. All those stats exactly. mean to him is money. It doesn't mean winning a Super Bowl really for the for for uh, uh, you know a, a fan base that had never won one before. It didn't matter with that for him. For and, him, it was about stats for money. And he's in the right team then because he's yeah, with he is. Matthew Stafford, who is a fantasy football darling. Because Stafford is one of the top quarterbacks in fantasy football. Because what does he do? He puts up big numbers. But tell me how many playoff games Stafford has won. Zero. And that's why. Because they throw the ball. How well does that work, really? I mean, remember, I mean, God, the best team to ever throw the ball ever was, was the team in San Diego in the 70s and 80s. And they went to like four or five championships. They have nothing to show for it. And, and yeah. that's the way this guy is. You know, he's going to throw for 50 touchdowns and he's going to throw for a thousand million yards, but he's not going to have anything to show for it. And if that's what he wants, good thing I'm glad he's not here because that's not what this team's about at all. You know, something else to keep in mind is that now Golden Tate is in charge of the one and done campaign for the Lions. You know. <laughs> <laughs> quest for one. The quest for one. And I think we are at a quest for the end of the first quarter. It's the end of the first quarter, bitches. Good discussion, guys. A lot of good stuff. We're going to take a quick break. And we'll be back with the start of the second quarter right after this. You're listening to the 12th Man Fan Jam. <laughs> On the Seahawk Positivity YouTube channel. Well, I, I I hear all that. What is an internet? Hey, if any of you are looking for any last-minute gift ideas for me, I have one. 
I like my boss right here tonight. I want him brought from his happy holiday slumber over there on Melody Lane with all the other rich people. And I want him brought right here with a big ribbon on his head. And I want to look him straight in the eye and I want to tell him what a cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, overstuffed, ignorant, blood sucking, dog kissing, brainless, hopeless, hopeless heartless, fat ass, bug eyed, stiff legged, spotty lip, worm headed sack of monkey shit he is. Hallelujah. Holy shit. Where's the Tylenol? And now it's time for the second quarter of the 12th Man Fan Jam. Here to take you through the second quarter is once again our host, the self-appointed Reverend Moses of the St. Paul Allen Church of Seahawk Positivity. Yes, thank you Magic Voice of the 12th Man Fan Jam. Welcome to the second quarter of a very special Cards Part de edition of the 12th Man Fan Jam. I do that just for Matt. He loves when I speak yeah, French. Yeah, thanks. Thanks ever so much for that. <laughs> yes, that's just for you. And uh, we, we uh, spend the second quarter usually talking about the game from the week before, and that is, of course, the 49er game. And we just happen to have someone on the, the 12th Man Fan Jam posse who lives very close to the 49er headquarters, and that is, of course, our stats man, Mark. Mark, um, of course, the Seahawks won 17-7. What was the immediate reaction around 49er land, and what has been 49er land been like this week with the realization that the playoffs are over? Well, as you, uh, <laughs> you know, as you might expect, uh, the you know the only thing uh, more wet around here than the rain falling are, are Niner fans' eyes. Um, I bet uh, the tears are delicious, are they not? Well, clearly, I'm the only one locally who's relishing the situation. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? I mean, there. I, I watched the game with with a Niner friend of mine, as is custom when we whenever we play, and he was just like, he was like, you know, you know, the playoffs are even before the game. You know, the playoffs are, you know, they're not going to happen. And he, I think, just locally, in a nutshell, the sentiment here is that they just cannot believe, and it's understandable. They just cannot believe how quickly this thing has fallen apart. And I think that the fact that they were going to lose to Seattle was just really a formality. So that was kind of the prevailing sentiment here. Yeah, that's what I, I kind of felt that same way, Matt. I kind of felt that they had already kind of already checked out for the year. Didn't you feel that way? Um, not Well, not the first. Uh, the first half, I thought they, 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 they came to play. Um, I think you were quite uh, prophetic, actually, when you um, said last week that uh, they would have to take the reins off uh, Kaepernick and make him run, because uh, he started to do some of this sort of stuff, and I was thinking, oh, we're going to have one of those sorts of games, are we? Um, but I think after the after the uh, half, yeah, then, it, then the wheels come off again, as it always has done for the whole season for um, the 49ers. Well, I think this is the I think they're now the longest team in NFL history or something to not score anything or any touchdowns in the in the second half of the game or the last quarter of the game or whatever it is. But you know, uh, yeah, I, I think by that point I'd, I'd worked out that they they'd uh, packed up and already emptied their lockers. Yeah, the only the only really sent the only real sentiment or. or, or you know, drama locally now is if he either goes to Oakland or, or, or Michigan. <laughs> right. That, that's just, that's just mind boggling, Dustin. I, I mean, this was supposed to be the beginning of the year. This was supposed to be the big rivalry, the 49ers and the Seahawks. And kind of, we kind of held, we kind of, we kind of didn't hold our bargain. The first couple games people were wondering, but now we are definitely holding our side of the bargain, but it seems like the 49ers kind of didn't uphold their side, doesn't it? Yeah, they um, they had a lot of injuries and they kind of um, took its toll. And then Harbaugh, he I I think I read somewhere where he's never been anywhere more than four years because his personality just grinds on everybody he's around. And I think that's kind of proven true again. Um, yes. The dude is a winner early, but man, does he fall off hard when he's done? And uh, he it's pretty obvious he lost that locker room. Going into that game, they had zero chemistry. They were checked out. And everybody knew Harbaugh was leaving. I mean, credit to the Niners in the first half, though. They came out trying to win the game. They just didn't have it in the end because of all the dysfunctional things that have been going on in that, in that um, organization. So I, I felt like last Friday was the uh, – I'm sorry, last Sunday was the, uh, the death of the 49ers-Seahawks rivalry. Uh, this next weekend is going to be the wake. And then the weekend after that's funeral because they are done. Yeah. 
Yes, I, I think that they are done. Certainly, they are eliminated from playoff contention. It'll be interesting to see if they can pull it together and finish strong with a nine seven or a seven and nine record. It's it's going to be interesting. Uh, what what Mark, uh, as far as just the game itself, what stood out to you as far as the Seahawks' key to winning, or what were some things that stood out game game wise about last week's game? Well, um, as as you know, uh, Dennis, uh, at times I can get uh, a bit frazzled. Uh, via my in-game texts yes i to, to update everybody else you know it's not unusual for uh, dennis and i to text uh, in game and and among the ones i sent early on in the first half were um this is crap period wtf are we doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i can tell you what we weren't doing was stopping the run Early on, which I replied and I quote, "Jesus, chill, dude. A lot of football left." Yeah, (laughs) yeah, true. I I had the exact answer on like copy and paste. So as soon as I start seeing it on the UK Facebook page, I'm like, "There's plenty of football in this game. Plenty of ball in this game." (laughs) Just yes. Well, like many these days, you know, I I I turn to the Reverend for guidance and support. Uh, Oh, we all. I tell you, probably the most frustrating thing about that first half was the offensive line, though. I think uh, four of the five linemen had penalties for either holding, false starts, or random other things. I mean, it was pretty ridiculous. That was really, really frustrating to see. It was. They, they got to get that right against uh, Arizona next week, man. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, Will, what was your take from the 49er game? Well, I figured uh, it would turn out kind of the way it was, I thought, because this was uh, the 49ers Super Bowl, so you know they were going to give it everything they had but everything they had wasn't that much. So I figured they'd play it tight in the first half and then we'd break away in the second, which of course is what happened. But yeah, it's just that, that whole game just had a really weird feel to it. I mean, normally it's 49ers week. Oh yeah. Everybody's excited. And this time it was just kind of another game, but I, I think it was a good test for us. Cause I think Arizona is going to play us a lot the same way, just with their, their defense. And I think they're going to, and they're going to pressure a lot because that's what they do. So one advantage we have, even though our offensive line is uh, messed up, is we kind of got a preview of what we can expect this coming weekend. Yeah, I think so. And we that'd be a nice segue going into third quarter when we talk about this Cardinal team that is uh, very similar to the 49er team, without question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> one of the one of the things which which caught which really did get me worked up was uh, the use of our timeouts. <laughs> I've never, I've never focused so much on the fact that we had no timeouts. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how did that happen? How is this? How has this occurred? <laughs> well, and because yeah. when you're out of timeouts, you're out of challenges too. Yeah, so totally. Right. We'd gotten a bad call in uh, San Francisco's favor. We would have been hosed. But it, yes. but it, it completely started to like um, take over my whole game. Was me staring at the top left hand corner of the screen at the fact that we had no timeouts. I had no idea why my brain decided to pick that particular, you know factor of the game to focus on but it wasn't it wasn't a good place to be it wasn't <laughs> no it, uh, will brought up a good point about bad calls because i think i can understand the frustration with the, the, the hit to russell wilson with yeah. the score you know 10 to 7 yeah. and it's a you know it's a third down play i think it was or or whatever i i get that i get the frustration of 49er nation but well, my, if you don't understand the rule well, if you understand see, the rule, then it's it, fine. It, was, it looked like he was – okay, then, then Dustin, here's what I saw, and I'm trying to figure it out. Are they saying that he put his head down into the chest of Russell Wilson? Yeah. Okay. You can't hit – it has to be – it's uh, uh, forehead up, basically. If you hit with your forehead up into the chest, that's penalty. Your face mask has to be what's leading. Now, he went – with uh, the forehead into Russell Wilson's chest, and then his eyes shifted up, which put his face mask there. And given the position of the referee on the backside, he saw how the dude's chin was tucked as he was going in, and then he didn't see the adjustment. Not that the adjustment would have made it legal because the initial contact was with the forehead. It's not just the crown. A lot of people think it's just the crown. Not true. It's the, the eyebrow line basically up, the forehead. And that's what hit Russell first. That's what caused the penalty. That's legit. Get but over it. But didn't the NFL come out and say that was a bad call? They did. Uh, I thought they and did. Th- and then other referees that are retired now also said, no, that's the right call. I made that same call. 
You know, okay. it's, yeah, it's, keep in mind the NFL know. also came out and said Super Bowl 40 was a well officiated game. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, even, you know, I can appreciate what, what Dustin's saying because it sounds like he, he, he knows the details of that rule. No matter what the rule is now, I don't know. I just, even though I'm a Seahawk fan, it benefited us tremendously. But I just, when I saw it, I'm like, that's just a bad call. I just, I just didn't think it was, uh, I just, I thought it was, I thought it was a bad call. And I just, because I want our defense to be able to hit an opposing QB like that and not be flagged, you know, coming yeah. up here, especially in the playoffs. I, See, when I, I first saw it, I thought it was spearing. I thought his, I thought his chin was tucked even farther. I thought that was the crown of his helmet. I thought it was spearing. Yeah. Right in the middle of the chest there. And then when I saw the replay, I was like, oh, it's not spearing, but he still has his chin tucked. That's the front of his forehead. That's penalty. Easy way to avoid that. Instead of putting your head there in the middle of his chest, put it to the side. Because yeah. even in, in youth football, they teach this heads up program where you have your you tackle with your eyes is what they tell you. If your eyes don't see what you're tackling, it's probably going to be a penalty in a lot of cases. So what you do is you get your eyes up. You put your head across the chest, not into it, and then you don't have to worry about that penalty. And that's an easy fix. I know people say it's a bam bam play. You don't have time to adjust. That's BS. And that's it. in that circumstance, you absolutely can do that. And he should have done that. And that's why it was a penalty and not a nice play. Well, sorry, Moses. I mean, I, no, I, I don't know. As a fan, I just sit here and I think to myself, I, I have to appreciate and understand that we want to make the game safer. I have to appreciate and understand the heads-up game that they're teaching kids to be safe, to play this game so they don't cause themselves long-term or permanent injury. I get it. I understand that. But my God, I want to see our defense hit people like that on a regular basis. And yeah. I don't know whether it's something in me that makes me want to be violent when I'm watching this game. But when I, <laughs> but when I saw that hit, I, I, to me, straight away, I'm, I, I, I'm very similar to Mark. I was like, I don't think that's bad. I think that's a bad call. I don't, it left a bad taste in my mouth, and I accept all the, all the rules and all the detail you've given, Dustin. But my God, I want to see football like that yeah. again. Amen. <laughs> you can hey. still see hits like that, but ask, let me ask you this. That high of an impact hit, if that helmet is under his left shoulder or right shoulder as he hit it, um, not necessarily at shoulder level, but same height as it was. If it slides off to the left, slides off to the right, he still wraps up, throw, knocks him to the ground. Is that any less of a hit? I, I, no, look, it's not it, any less of a hit, and it's less likely to cause that injury, which it is why they call it. But what you're doing, though, is you're, you're asking someone like Ed Hockley to be able to make an, an absolute split millisecond decision as to whether it was the crown, the, the forehead, what was hitting him at that point. And to me, I, I don't want games to come down to whether or not a 60-odd-year-old man has enough speed and eyesight to understand at what direction some of the players' eyes were, were, were leveled at. Well, it's not so much as I... I, mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I'll let it go. I hear what you're saying. This, I can go on all night, so I'll let it go. You know, well, we, had a, we had a play in the Eagles game last week uh, at the end of the first half where... Russell Wilson threw a pass, and an Eagles defender gave him a forearm to the helmet, knocked him flat on his back. Right. That was not called. So I don't feel too bad about this one, to be honest. Oh, I don't, yeah. I don't and either. I was get, and I was getting annoyed at Troy Aikman when I watched the replay oh my going God. on and on and on and on and on about the call. And, and how thing, their offense – listen, my argument was this. Okay, fine. Your offense generated four first downs the whole second half. Four. So you're telling me all of a sudden they're going to find a way to march down the field and get the game-winning score against us? <laughs> well, it's not happening. Even even nah. when they got even when they managed to get that run back interception thing, the only person who was able they weren't able to get past was Russell Wilson who tackled it out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm just glad it wasn't a Bill Levy uh, officiated game because yeah. that would have been a penalty oh. on the quarterback. Yeah, it's yeah trying exactly. to tackle the guy. <laughs> oh gosh. Totally. Oh. Yeah, the, one, the one thing I do. One thing I do in plays like that too is, is to, to try and get a perspective of objectivity a little bit. Is you know I flip the circumstances and I say, okay, if that was Bobby Wagner that hit Kaepernick that way, you know, do I want that to be, you know, would would I think it was BBS if the, if he were flagged and, and I probably would, you know, it's like if I flip the circumstances, sometimes that helps me put in a little better perspective. I agree. Would I want it to be a penalty? No, but is it actually a penalty within the rules? Yes, it is absolutely. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Well, let's stop there and let's go to two minute warning and go over our predictions, prognostications from last week. Holy sh! It's a two minute warning. Uh, we had only three people giving predictions last week. Mark, uh, as you see on the screen, Mark said thirty one thirteen. Matt said twenty four six, 
and I said 34 to 13. The final score was 17 to 7. I think Matt was pretty close. That was pretty good, Matt. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Yay! Good like that. Um, so congratulations there. Our prognostications the week before have been – we did a very nice job at the Philadelphia game. We did a terrible job here. Well, I don't right, know. The, I think mine was pretty close. Well, you said that Kaepernick would get benched. Did he score anything in the entire second half? Oh. <laughs> Did he get yeah. benched? He uh, might as well have been. He did not get benched. <laughs> was he sure. sitting down at any point when the Seahawks hit him? No. Yes. Mark, <laughs> he was benched when the defense was out there. Uh, Sherman, two interceptions from Mark. He had none. And I said three touchdowns for Wilson. So he only had one touchdown pass. I'm going to just say we all, we all stunk that up. one. Yeah. <laughs> and game balls. Uh, Mark said Sherman, Matt said Earl Thomas the third, Moses, I said Wilson. Uh, if you're giving a game ball in this game, who are you going to give the game ball to, Mark? Well, you know, he didn't have any picks, but uh, Sherman uh, was a shutdown corner. Now, um, yeah. you know, I, you know, I, boy, I mean, it's uh, it's one another one of those games you could give it to any number of people. Um, Shoot, who would I, you know, um, he didn't get 100 yards, but I mean, I think uh, Lynch did end up with 93. Yeah. Yeah. Right around there. So, I mean, I, I guess I'd probably, you know, I'd probably give it to him again. Uh, Dustin, who would you give game ball to? I might go Hill. Hill had a pretty decent game. Yeah. Um, he was running up he there did. and made a couple of plays. So, I, I might yeah. go him from the defensive line point. That's a good call. Uh, Will, who would you do? I'm going to think outside the box. I'm going to go with Paul Richardson. He had a lot of uh, good catches and a lot of key moments. Yeah. Had another one that would have got Seattle inside the 10 if it weren't for a bad holding penalty. Yeah. And I'm just really impressed with the way this kid's coming along of late. Very nice, Matt. I'd go with Dustin. I'd go with Lynch. I, I think I might go with Jermaine Curse. Because did he not have five or six catches for about 80 yards? He had some Something nice like plays. He had, some, he had a very nice game. I might go with Chop Chop in this game. Go a little, go a little different, but... Uh, but, yeah, it was a great win for Seattle. Uh, they, the 49ers are no longer uh, – they are in our rearview mirror for the next two games. And as we come to the end of the second quarter – Holy sh! it's halftime. A very special halftime coming up for you. You will, you will not want to miss this. We are going to give a eulogy to the passing of the playoff hopes for the 2014 San Francisco 49ers. So stay tuned for that for sure. That is coming up right after this quick station identification. Hey, this is Matt, all the way from Merry Old England, and you're listening to the 12th Man Fan Jam. Now with the passing of the playoff hopes of the 2014 San Francisco 49ers, Reverend Moses with a eulogy. Friends, countrymen, Seahawk fans, lend me your ear. We come not to praise the 49ers this evening, but to bury them. Yes, they were officially eliminated from playoff contention for the 2014 season, and we'd like to pay our last... Well, we don't want to pay our last respects, but... We want to revel in it a little bit if we could. Oh, you silly 2014 49ers. You were so cocky coming into the season. You were so confident as the season started. Never mind that half your team was spending the offseason answering questions to the law enforcement officers. This was going to be your year, wasn't it? And when you beat the Cowboys in the very first game of the year, you were ready to take the NFL world by storm. The quest for six was alive and well. Take that, Seattle. We're coming for your crown. Then reality set in. You fell to one and two, but hey, it's the 49ers, right? This season's just starting. I mean, we've got Kaepernick at quarterback. Yes, and although you squeaked past Philadelphia in week five or four, you did have Kaepernick at quarterback. Lazy one look, Kaepernick. The man who thinks looking and acting like a kid just sprung from juvie was the answer to everything. But he wasn't, was he? He can run, but he can't hide. He can't hide from the fact that he's a tremendous athlete with the brain of a little leaguer. But still, you entered your bye week four and three, and still with a decent mathematical chance to still make those playoffs in 2014. Oh, but those pesky Rams. But that's okay. You win your next three, and it's seven and four, 
Things are looking up again in 49er Nation. What happened next? The Seattle Seahawks happened next, didn't they? We all know how that worked out for you. Thanksgiving at home, national television. And who's that eating turkey on your logo at midfield? Richard Sherman and Russell Wilson. But that's okay, because you can write this playoff ship in Oakland next week. And, oh, oh no, the Raiders. The 1-11 and Raiders beat you by double digits. And then, who put the Seahawks back on the schedule again? We have to play them twice? Yes, yes you did. And quicker than you can say you're back, you're left back. 7-7, seven and seven, and officially eliminated from playoff contention. So it is not with a heavy heart, but with a joyous heart, that we here at the 12th Man Fan Jam say goodbye and good riddance to the 2014 San Francisco 49er playoff hopes. And we close this door to the playoffs by saying no more. No more 49er fans reminding everyone of Lombardi trophies from the last century. No more bicep kissing. No more Walmart khakis. No more felons dressed in red and gold. No more lifting Kaepernick up higher than what he is, a runner that throws. No more. I want cake now! No more awkward post-game press conferences. No more owners scolding head coaches through Twitter. No more hearing Niner fans whine about this call or that call. Real teams play through that garbage. No more Quest for Six. No more best rivalry in the NFL. No more who's got it better than us. No more. That's right. No more, Niner fans. Pack up and get ready for next year. Meanwhile, the Seahawks still have some football to play. And they're playing this week against the Arizona Cardinals for a game that means something. And we're going to be right back after this quick station identification. You're listening to the 12th Man Fan Jam on the Seahawk Positivity YouTube channel. Well, I, I, I hear all that. What is an internet? You got tools. Santa paid good money for those tools. You can't build with the tools you have. You can't build garbage. You are garbage. Hit the bricks, pal, and beat it because you are going out. Hey, hey, our tools are weak. Your tools are weak. The effing tools are weak. You're weak. I've been in this business for 615 years. Hey, what's your name? Screw you. That's my name. It's the third quarter, bitches. I'm so lonely. So lonely. So lonely and sad real wrong. We're so ronery on this show. No one, just me only, sitting on my rental's wall. All right, we're so ronery on this show. Welcome to the third quarter and the start of the second half of the 12th Man Fan Jam. I just had to throw that in somewhere on the show after it was brought in by Will so beautifully at the start of the show. Um, we hope that we're not causing uh, a, a war between North Korea and the United States. And if we are, oh, well. It is Bring it. We'll bitch. win. Bring we'll it, win. yeah. Um, we, this is the third quarter. We usually talk about the game coming up, and it is a huge one. Seattle and Arizona. Arizona is 11-3. Seattle's 10-4 a win. Seattle gets the division lead with one game left at home against the Rams. And it is absolutely huge, Will. What, what should we be looking for in this game? Well, Bruce Arians is a lot like Pete Carroll in that he doesn't let uh, injuries or things slow him down. He's going to do what he wants. So they are going to bring it on defense. Uh, they think, think they blitz more than any other team in the league, and they run blitz very well. And on offense, I don't think Arians cares that he's got Ryan Lindley at quarterback. He's going to take his shots. So anybody expecting Arizona to roll over and die needs to needs – to, uh, Note how Arizona manages to keep winning despite a team that's held together by spit and duct tape. Oh my God! And that the truth. And let's let's before we go any further, 
Let's talk about Bruce Arias for just a minute because I absolutely love this guy. And, I, and I'll and tell you why. Because of what he said this week. And I, I just – his attitude – first off, he, he has been doing it with mirrors for the last year and a half down in, down in Arizona and has been doing a spectacular job of coaching. But when they asked him this week, is this a big game? Heck, yeah, it's a big game. It's huge. Are you kidding me? I love it. I love the attitude. I love this guy. He took his team and said, look, the beginning of the year – this is your locker room. The Super Bowl is going to be held here. Someone else is going to be in your locker room unless you do something about it. I love that idea of carrying that through the season. And then this game, all week he's been going, yeah, it's a big game. It's huge. It's gigantic. This is a great game. I'm glad to be a part of it. I love this guy. You guys, What do you guys think about Arians? I think that it's uh, he's easy to like, and you like his interactions with the media and the things he says, which is um, – Kind of disappointing because with Harbaugh <laughs> leaving, looks yeah. like Arizona is going to be our rival. It's going to yeah. be harder to hate Agreed. Arizona than it's going to be San Francisco. Absolutely. He's the anti Harbaugh. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that dude. Because when that, when that Cardinal, I can't remember which Cardinal player it was, but when the Cardinal dropped the wide open touchdown um, and he walked off the field and, and Aaron was just giving him a hug and a cuddle and a laugh yes. and just sort of like, you know, whatever. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Absolutely, and I I will have a hard time hating that guy. Just well, and, and not only that, the personality is fine and all and well, but the guy can just coach like unbelievable. What he did here in Indianapolis when Pagano went out with cancer for weeks, and yeah. Arians, you know what he did here in, in in Indianapolis. Then he goes to Arizona, does the exact same thing. This guy has got the coaching bug. He's fascinating, and he's just a fascinating guy. And I couldn't be happier for him. Well, he reminds, I mean, he, he reminds everyone, any football fan, um, no matter who you root for, what good coaching can do and what motivation mm-hmm. does without, with, in, in doing it in, a, in a, um, a, a diverse way where he knows his X's and O's, but he also knows how to manage personalities and he knows when to be harsh and um, when to let up a little bit. Because if, you know, if he's a, a one trick pony, if he's like a Singletary or, whatever other demonstrative coach of the past where it's a yelling and screaming thing, they just tune you out. So he's just done a masterful job of, of getting these guys to, to believe, you know, that, yes. that they can do anything. Yeah. Yes, they adopted sure. that next man out mentality and it's worked really well. I mean, they, they all buy in uh, similar to what Pete Carroll's done. Everybody buys mm-hmm. in. Um, they step up, they're coached well. And when their number's called, they take care of business, uh, except for the quarterback on that team. So. I think I think that's a I think that's a great great thing you talked about you know they bought into the program they exactly what is happening with us which is why we are where we are is because our guys buy into this program that's presented them by our coach and I think the same thing down there and you see two clubs that are very successful now be, in in our division because they bought into the program and you see another club that was supposed to be really successful who the players don't seem to have bought in and the coach doesn't seem to buy into the program. And you see what happens there. <laughs> Sorry, not not naming any names. Forty <laughs> nineers. Um. So so Matt, you know, okay, Arian's a great guy, but we want to win this game. How are we going to yep. do it? Well, I think there are, there are two things really. The first thing I want to sort of think about is getting the rush, uh, the running game established. I mean, Arizona have been pretty good at holding down the the run, as I understand. Um. But the other thing, which you you know, I'm going to say it because it's going to come out every time I have to speak about the Seahawks. <laughs> we are we are going to, have to make very very sure that we don't penalise ourselves too badly. Yeah. Now, actually, we didn't do too badly. I don't think anyway. We had 50 yards. I think seven penalties for 50 yards against uh, the Winers. In fact, they got more penalties against one of them. I think. Um, but uh, we what we don't want to do here is make this very difficult. Last time we played them, uh, Fitzgerald was out, I believe. Um, he's yeah. back. So they've got, um, I think, Ellington and Fitzgerald. You, you know, you've just got to, we've got to watch those two. I want Sherman, Mark, um, you know, covering Fitzgerald the whole game. Because <laughs> you know, no, El- like, Ellington's he, out he, for the year, though. Ellington's so. out, isn't he? Yeah, but um, yeah. who's the other bloke that they've got? What's um, they're running? Because they had that running bloke. It was no, they have a, it's a, it's a, it's a Ker- Kerwin, guy the, the guy who Kerwin. likes the Williams. Kerwitch. Yeah, Kerwin Williams. Yeah. Um, but you know, but I want to show. I just Fitzgerald has got to be covered because you know we not that we, not that we're not um, sort of open to 
him doing everything himself, I don't think he will in this game at all. Especially if he's got a quarterback who's going to make some errant throws. But I want Sherman Roman because that's going to be his go-to guy, isn't it? So if he's going to throw a bad throw, I want Sherman to be underneath it to either tip it, catch it, or run it back. Cool. All right. Uh, Mark, what are your some of your keys to this game? You know, I, looking at, at Arizona and, and, you know, major respect again to their coach and, and how well they've done this year. But right now, especially with Lindley starting, there is so little margin for error <laughs> for this team. I mean, they're, they're going to need – this is one of those games where I really believe the Cardinals are going to need um, – you know, some kind of special teams touchdown, um, mm-hmm. you know, some kind of um, awesome return to create a shorter field for their offense, a defensive touchdown. I just, I think they're going to need something extra, um, you know, special uh, in, in a fluky kind of way for them to really be in this thing. Uh, their defense is, is, is going to be awesome. Um, I think, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we need to score however many points, but, you know, early on, uh, the Seahawks need to win the field position battle. So if we do, if they do force a punt, we're putting Lindley in long drive situations. And um, eventually, you know, that field posi- position battle uh, ends up to where it just makes it easier for like us to score. You know, we only have to go 30 or 40 yards for a score or for a field goal or whatever, just to get, you know, put points on the board early. Sounds good. Dustin, what do you think are some keys to this game coming up against the Cardinals? I think got to spread out that defense. Their offense really isn't going to be able to do much of anything. Uh, the quarterback is not good. Um, we proved that when we beat them 58 nothing. The um, running backs are hurting on that team right now. They're they're down to, what, their third, four-string running back, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to come down to our offense versus their defense because our defense is going to handle business. So I think what they need to look to do is spread out the field because if you if you look at the previous game, what they like to do is uh, if Seahawks had two receivers on one side, the the Cardinals are going to crash from one side and then assign a linebacker to go out to the opposite side and contain Russell. So if they spread it out, four receivers wide quite a bit, there's going to be they're, they're not going to be able to do that. It's going to open up some lanes, open up some gaps, and we're going to have a a running back in Lynch who can take advantage of a lot of that. I know people are saying that they need to run away from Cleus Campbell, stuff, especially if he's in the middle. But I say just run it up the gut on those guys when you spread it out. Uh, get Lynch going that way. And don't allow them to crash one side or the other. Make them play against our receivers. Because they have Patrick Peterson and, and whatnot, and they can they feel like they can shut down our first two receivers. We can put more on the field than that and also have the tight end. I think if we do that, they're not going to be able to blitz the way they like to. They're not going to be able to jump in there the way they like to. And we're going to be able to take advantage. And once they start losing and they start gambling because they feel like the defense needs to make plays, Mm -hmm. that's when we're going to take advantage and that's when we're going to have our big plays and that's how we're going to win this game. Yeah, very nice. You know, Kaepernick, for what he is, and I'm bringing this up for a reason, Kaepernick is an athlete, and he made some plays with his feet last week. And that's what I said he'd have to do. This is a very similar game to last week. And and I think people, again, or Matt said this a couple weeks ago, people are going to be upset the first quarter, second quarter. It's <laughs> going to be a slow, it's going to be a slow, methodical beatdown. Their defense is very good. They're sixth in the league against a run. But I say, believe it or not, I, I keep hitting them in the face because i tell you why. Their offense is not going to have any prolonged drives to give them any rest. So as we get to the second, third, and fourth quarter, we're going to be able to wear them down with 24. You know, keep hitting this line. You're getting one yard. You're getting two yards. It doesn't matter. Third and fourth quarter, those two and three yards are going to become five and six yards because those guys are going to get tired of tackling 24 every time because they're not going to have a lot of rest because our defense is going to prevent their offense from getting anything going, I think. And so there's going to be a lot of three and outs from them, and their defense is going to get tired. So I say keep running the ball. Also, they're 29th in the league against the pass. We can throw deep on these guys, and and I think Russell has started to show signs. Not Russell. The offense has started to show signs that we want to go down deep a little bit. And every once in a while, we're throwing that, that deeper pass and that deeper pass. Let's do a couple of those to set up some runs. And let's just keep pounding them and playing Seahawk football for four quarters. And it may not be pretty. It may not be the 50 nothing game everybody wants at the end of one quarter, but I think eventually 
they're going to wear down that defense to where they just cannot handle four quarters of Marshawn Lynch running over them. And I think it's going to be a slow, methodical beatdown like it always is with this team, like it was last week. The big difference is I think the, the 49ers had more talent on offense than the, than the Cardinals do, especially well, Moses, running the ball. Moses, I think you hit on something really good, and it's uh, one thing I was encouraged from from last week was we did throw deep a few times, and mm-hmm. we completed some deep passes. Yes. And I think what we need in this game is we need a couple of short fields, either through mm-hmm. big plays or turnovers or – Here's an idea. Maybe we can actually get a decent return once in a while. But <laughs> we need a couple of short fields, and we need to capitalize when we get them because yes. the, the long drives, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to get too many long drives in this game. So we need, we, we need a couple of short, short ones. Yeah, yeah. I'm, kinda, I'm kind of fearing the, um, that downfield long pass like you guys are talking about. I think Russell should throw him down there. I don't think we're going to be very successful. But it'd be nice to move the safeties back because yeah. they blitz. They blitz so much. They do, and we don't have. I mean, we're missing Unger. We're missing Okun this week. Mm-hmm. We're we're gonna have weaknesses on an offensive line that already has weaknesses. So but didn't. But the problem that those long routes like that take extra time in the pocket. That's the problem mm-hmm. with having those. You know what I mean? Because sure. We're going to get blitzed, and Russell's going to get hit. He's going to get knocked down. I, I'm more, I'm more thinking that the short to intermediate pass and the screen pass, if we can do that efficiently, would help us much more than trying to take those shots downfield. Russell can throw it downfield far as he wants, but, but I don't that, know. That he's going to have time but, to make however, it happen. However, Dustin, um, yeah, we were having those same problems last week. I mean, we were without. Uh, Unger for the whole game and Okung for half of it. We were getting blitzed last week. Russell was getting pummeled last week, and we still got a couple of long passes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, San the, the, Car- the Cardinals. Hang on, hang on, hang on. The Cardinals are going to blitz us, and uh, there's not going to be many opportunities. But there's going to even in this game, there's going to be some opportunities for some long passes. We need to take them, and I think we can connect on them. I think that the Cardinals are better at it than San Francisco, better than San Fran, though. So it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So if he, they're going to be early forced throws. As long as he overthrows it, no big deal. But Russell can't underthrow like he did to Richardson last week because if he does that, mm-hmm. we're setting ourselves up for failure when that happens. We, well, but those take- short, don't those short passes leak those safeties up close where they're going to be anyway? I mean, aren't we trying to back them off a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. It it, it depends. What I was saying about – um. The the quick release passes is what I meant with those short team reading passes. That that'll be good. If uh, I just I don't trust our offensive line to the point where I think that they're going to be able to give Russell three to five seconds to throw a long pass. Well, and, and I'm not thinking like fifteen of them either. I'm thinking one or two to kind of get them on their heels a little bit. It's going to be there, but you have to pick when you can do it. And I'm not saying they do fifteen of them. I'm saying exactly. one or two. You know that's. It's it's going to be there maybe once a quarter. It's going to be there, but it's going to be there. And I think we need to look at it because these guys, you know, is, for what Peterson said at the beginning of the year, hey, 29th in the league against the pass. Numbers don't lie, Peterson. And I'm sorry, but you were you were actually you completely destroyed by an Atlanta Falcon team, and they have great receivers. But, I mean, this is a team that is a liability against the pass. And if we can capitalize on that, to kind of pass to set up the run as opposed to run to set up the pass. Now, I'm not saying every pass has to be a 50-yarder, but I'm saying they, we probably need, yeah, short passes, screens, fine. But we need to pass on this team as well as not give up on the run just because they're good against the run. Because you know what? We're pretty good running the ball. So let's knock them around for four quarters. And I think with our defense is going to shut down their offense to where their defense isn't going to get a lot of breaks. And we get to third, fourth quarter, those one or two yarders by Lynch are going to become six, seven yarders because those guys are just going to flat out get tired. I really feel that way. And if we can pass to set that up, I think that's even better. But that is what you that win. is. Hey, <laughs> you, you convince me, sir. You convince me. I'm the champion. <laughs> I'm the champion. Just, uh, just, uh, Reverend just Moses. <laughs> the problem, man, with 
one thing that Dustin was saying, which he's absolutely right about, is that they do blitz a lot. And so one of the things we've got to look up, we've got to take care of, is that Russell's got to take care of himself properly on this game. Again, you know, he's, he's incredibly good at, at being evasive. He's incredibly good at, at, at uh, sliding and keeping himself safe. He's got to do a special job in this case, because the last thing I want to do is go into the end of the season with an injury on the quarterback. But also he's got to take care of the ball. We can't have any balls flying, you know, mm-hmm. turnovers happening because of blitzing and, and fumbles and these sorts of things absolutely imperative that we take care of the ball and have zero turnovers in this game because if we don't we are going to end up giving them short fields and that's exactly what they're going to need for their third string quarterback absolutely, absolutely no uh no uh going forward on fourth down and th- or you know going for it late and throwing an interception letting him re- uh run it back you gotta take the points yeah. the point. eight the seconds points. left in the first half kick the damn field goal take the damn <laughs> exactly <laughs> yep yep Yep, yep, yep. Well, speaking of Kiki, we're going to kick it to the end of the third here. It's the end of the third quarter, bitches. That is the end of the third quarter. We will come back to fourth quarter. We will give our predictions, our prognostications, our game ball for this very important matchup between your Seattle Seahawks and the Arizona Cardinals right after this. You're listening to the 12th Man Fan Jam (laughs) on the Seahawk Positivity YouTube channel. Next. What do you want? Well, come on, what do you want? F- with my beard. It's not real. No sh. Well, it was real, but you see, I got sick and all the hair fell out, so I had to wear this f- thing. How'd you get sick? I loved a woman who wasn't clean. Mrs. Santa? No, it was her sister. What's it like at the North Pole? Like the suburbs. Which one? Apache Junction. What the f do you care? Now get off my lap. You are really Santa, right? No, I'm an accountant. I wear this fucking thing as a fashion statement, all right? Okay. And now it's time for the fourth quarter of the 12th Man Fan Jam. Here to lead us through the final quarter is once again our host, the self appointed Reverend Moses of the St. Paul Allen Church of Seahawk Positivity. Yes, welcome back to a very special fourth and final quarter of the. Special Cardinals Part 2 edition of the 12th Man Fan Jam. I am your host, the self-appointed Reverend Moses of the St. Paul Allen Church of Seahawk Positivity. And with my posse, Matt, Dustin, Will, and Mark, we will now make our predictions, our prognostications, and our game balls. We'll give you a score. We'll give you something that we think is going to be stand out in the game, a performance by a player or a team or something. And then we will give our game balls, or who we think will get a game ball at the end of the day. So we will start with Mark. Mark from sunny California. Hi, Mark. Hey, everybody. Um, let's see. For a score, I'm going to call it uh, 20 to 13 Seahawks. And let's see. Prognostication. You know, I'm going to, I think Doug Baldwin, since, you know, we're going to have to throw, and I just think he works his way open enough on any number of kind of routes, you know, short, intermediate, long, whatever. I think he has over 100 yards receiving. And I'll give him the game ball as well. Wow, that was that was very efficient right there. That's how you do it. That was efficient, Dustin. Are you that efficient? Sure, sounds good. All right, how you doing? Ah, uh, good. How are you, sir? Great. I am so glad you were able to make it this evening. I was worried. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad I was too. It was a point of emphasis for me to actually make it. I didn't want to miss too many weeks in a row. Ah, oh, that's great. We're, and we, we appreciate you for that. Because we yeah. will replace you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm afraid of that. Next well, man I don't up. That, man I don't want to lose that paycheck. <laughs> we will, yeah, we, we'll cut your salary a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, I think the score is going to be 24 to 6, Hawks. Uh, prognostication is going to be, I think Bobby Wagner is going to have probably 15 tackles. I don't think that. Um, they're going to be able to throw much with that awesome quarterback they have starting. So I think they're going to try to run the ball on us, and I think Wagner is going to handle that. And uh, he's also going to get my game ball for the week because of all the tackles. Ryan, Ryan Lindley. Yes, Ryan Lindley. You know of the Arizona Lindleys, Ryan Lindley. Sounds like some <laughs> kid who gets beat up every day. All right. Well done, Dustin. Um, Will the Thrill. Yes, sir. Okay. I am going to go Seahawks 17, Cardinals 6. 
I think Seattle, my prognostication is Seattle is going to get a defensive touchdown. And since uh, Lindley is going to try to throw away from Sherman as much as possible, I'm going to give it to Matt's favorite player, Therald Simon. I think he gets a pick six or a fumble <laughs> return for touchdown. <laughs> going out on a limb here, but we'll see. You, now sir, are living in dreamland. <laughs> oh, that we'll happens. See. Hey. So, for the record, Simon hasn't done anything stupid in a few weeks, so he's Yay! getting better. Yeah, but he's your, um, he's your type he of dude, Matt. He is nice and long. He can go up there and get that ball. He, uh, that. he turned up to practice. That was the stupidest thing he did. Oh! <laughs> yeah. Oh. But anyway, my game ball is going to go to our newest long-term Seahawk as to as of today, Cliff Averill. I think he's going to get three sacks on Lindley and generally just be a holy terror in their, uh, in their backfield all day long. <laughs> Bravo. Excellent. Well done. Matt, how can you yes. top that? Well, I've got two sets of scores, two sets of prognostications and two sets of predictions. And just depends whether I'm feeling optimistic so or whether I'm feeling realistic. Um, I'm going to go with, with a mixture, I think. Um, mine is going to be um, Seahawks 20, Arizona 9. All right. Guessing is that your this, optimistic or realistic uh, this one? Is, this is actually my optimistic one. <laughs> God. Um, is, as I understand it, Helfer is due to return this week, is he not? He is, he is. Yep. Ah, great work. My prognostication is that Kaepernick will be benched in the fourth quarter. <laughs> um <laughs> You're never letting that one go, are you? Nice. Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna oh, he gets one of these <laughs> It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, no, um, I think Helfert scores two touchdowns is my prognostication for this one. And then he takes off that hat and his hair's fabulous. Everything about him is fabulous. And I then, um, <laughs> and then he, get, and, uh, he gets my game ball. So All right. I'm sure he does. More all than is, the game ball. <laughs> all is... All is well Ooh. in the all is well in the uh, Suffolk Blue household oh, with the return of Helfer. Oh, Helly's fit. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, I guess it's up to me now. That's a tough back that, Moses. I know, right? <laughs> well, uh, I'm gonna say 23 to 10. The good guys. Um, I, my my prognostication. I I I used to when the when the Seahawks would play the Cardinals. It always drove me crazy because that kicker they had that would always kick the 50-yard field goals drove me crazy. And he was always a loud mouth, and I couldn't stand him. But now I'm sitting here, and I'm telling you, I don't even know who it was. It was, it was back Bill when the – Bill Dramatica? No, see, when, when, when the, in, the, in the beginning of the 21st century, when, when, when Hasselbeck, when we were doing all the things with Holmgren, their kicker would always kick these 50-plus-yard field goals, and he drove <laughs> – Neil Who? Rackers. 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 Oh, nice. Yeah, God. that's right. That's right. Ah, oh, Neil Rackers. So it's revenge time. And I see our money Hauschka kicking a field goal in this game longer than 55 yards. That's my prognostication. And I'm giving that young man money Hauschka's getting my game ball because it was 23 to 10. He's knocking three of those through there. And I bet two of those three are going to be 50 yards or bigger. So there's my game ball, and it's not the size of the field goal. It's how you kick it. <laughs> it's <right>. the length. <laughs> oh, my God. Well. Look at the innuendos. All right, and we'll end on innuendos. It looks like it's time to bring another award-winning, wonderful, and amazing 12th Man Fan Jam to a sad close. We are so glad you decided to waste some time with us. Uh, it was, as usual, a show that raised the bar here at the Seahawk Positivity YouTube channel. We certainly hope you laughed a little bit and maybe, just maybe, you know, learned a little something along the way. And what did we learn on the show this evening? Well, we learned that the Jets let their Woody slip out. <laughs> we learned that Garbaggio <laughs> is a special kind of garbage. <laughs> we And finally, we learned that Matt wants help its game ball. So, on behalf <laughs> of my partner in crime, Matt, our new sound Shadowhawk Will, Statsman Mark, and Dustin... This is your self-appointed Reverend Moses of the St. Paul Allen Church of Seahawk Positivity saying, enjoy the game Sunday, and as always, Go Hawks! Go, go, go Hawks! Hawks.